you want to present uh, today a talk that shows us how to go from synchronous flask to asynchronous sonic. Is that correct? Um, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much it. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, so Thank if you, you have your screenshot, uh, screen share ready, then please activate it and I'll give you the spotlight and hope you have a great talk. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is David and today we're going to talk about flashing to wait. Um, before we get started, I'll tell you a few words about myself. Uh, I'm, a I'm a husband, I'm a father of two boys, I'm a Pythonista for the last decade or so, and I'm a scale nerd. In addition, I recently started working for NVIDIA as a software architect. Before we get started, I want a set of expectations. This session is more of a mind opener on how, on how added value can be provided with minimal effort. This session is definitely not about saying that this technology is good or that technology is bad. Uh, that, that's not the message here. In addition, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that all the attendees have uh, prior knowledge in web development and in REST APIs in particular. So um, first, let's get started with some motivation. Um, you can see the code on the left. The code on the left is a pretty basic uh, Flask code, and the code on the right is a pretty basic Sunny code. So if you take the code on the left and you transform it to the code on the right, as you can see, there aren't that many differences. Uh, then you can get between three and four X performance improvement, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, here, here you can see the results of my benchmark. The benchmark that I did is 10,000 requests with 100 concurrently level. And as you can see for a flask, uh, this took around 750 Second, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for, for Flask, it took about 750 requests per second with Sonic uh, around 2,500. Uh, 20, 2, and the time per request uh, correlated as well. For, for Flask, it's 130 milliseconds, and with Sonic, it's 40 milliseconds. Um, some, extra, some extra notes about my motivation experiments. Um, for Flask, I installed simple JSON as an optional dependency, uh, as recommended in their documentation. By the way, whenever you see this uh, sort of link um, in my presentation, it is a link. So if you'll get to the presentations later, everything is linkable. And the tool I use for benchmarking is a, a tool called AB, which, which stands for Apache Benchmarking. So uh, a couple of words about Flask. Flask is a micro web framework that revolutionized how web is developed with Python. By micro web framework, meaning that as opposed to Django, the Django is what's called a framework, a web framework with batteries included. Uh, Flask does not include almost anything by its own. Whatever you need, anything, I don't know, cookies, authentication, whatever, uh, you need to either implement yourself or use a third party. Um, to my opinion, it revolutionized uh, web in Python because uh, of its simplicity, uh, because of its major simplicity. Uh, async IO. Async IO is a library to write concurrent IO bound code using the async await syntax. Um, what's IO bound code? IO bound code, for example, is uh, making HTTP requests. Um, an example for something that's not I.O. bound or to be more accurate to something that's CPU bound is compression. Uh, this, this line is important for, for the, next of the, uh, the, ne the next couple of slides. Um, so why I think I.O.? Uh, what's wrong with, uh, I don't know, thread per request or process per request? Um, currently, uh, we consume more HTTP services than ever. Uh, we can quite easily reach uh, 10,000 concurrent connections on, the, on, the, on a single server, uh, aka the C10K problem. Um, and as a result, a cooperative task that can better utilize the CPU on, on, on a single machine can save us a lot of money. Sonic is a Python 3.6 uh, 
uh, and above a web server and, and web framework that's written to go fast uh, using the async await syntax. And now I would like to introduce to you to PyAday. Uh, PyAday is an application. Uh, well, it, it does several things. It's a CRUD for Python packages metadata that's used by its content curators. And you can get your daily random Python package info for fun and profit. So uh, here, here's the gist of it. Um, when you call a route named run, then you get a response JSON uh, with info on the random Python package, and then and now and now you can learn like new stuff pretty pretty fast. Um, I used HTTP for for this uh, for this demo, but you can use curl or whatever as well. This is how the main of the app looks like. Um, you call the Flask constructor and you register two blueprints, blueprints for packages and blueprints for run. Um, the way I look at blueprints when it comes to REST, um, I like to put in one blueprint all, 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 the, um, all the HTTP methods of a certain REST resource that I would like to consume. So if we're talking about my example, we're we talked about uh, packages CRUD, then all, all the CRUD operations of the packages route will all be in the same blueprint. Um, and, the, and the round route will be the single route on the, on the round blueprint. Here you can see a couple of imports. And here you can see uh, our glorious database, which is a list of dictionaries. You can also see uh, we're in it, the blueprint here. Uh, now let's go through the, the CRUD methods. Start with, with the C, the create. Whenever there is a post to packages, then I add the new package to our database. Um, and as a custom in REST, I return a 201 status code, an empty response, and I return like a reference to the newly created package on the location header. Moving on to the R, the read. Here, here you can see a get request where we get a package name as input, uh, we check for the package with that name in our database. And if it exists, we return a JSON response with it. Otherwise, we return a 404 response with an explanation and, and, and a relevant content type. Moving on to the U, the update. Here, you can see there is a put method. It can, it can also be a fetch method. It depends on what do you do. Again. We search for the package in our database. Uh, if we find it, we changed, uh, we update it and return a 204 status code with an empty response. Otherwise, as previously, we return a 404. And the delete method, again, gets the package name as input. If it finds it in the database, it deletes it and returns a 204 status code. Otherwise, it returns a four four. And now you can see the run blueprint. Again, we need the blueprint and there is a get route that returns a random package from our database. So why convert? Um, if you have a large scale expensive cloud, cloud deployment or you have a limited resources on premise deployment, you could get a better bang for your buck meaning it could save you a lot of money. In addition, we'll show you that the migration is not difficult and all the Flask knowledge accumulated this far is not wasted. So let the conversion begin. Uh, as a prerequisite, we need a project that could benefit uh, from the conversion, uh, meaning that it mostly does IO. Uh, and it's written in Python, in, in Python version between 3.6 and 3.8. Uh, I used uh, Python 3.3.3. Um, next step is not mandatory. It's my preferences. My preference, uh, poetry in it and poetry adds unique. Uh, poetry is a dependency manager. Um, the great thing about it is that you'll get, you get a log file 
out of the box, so you never need to remember to add something to your requirements file. Uh, again, there is a reference here. You could, uh, you could follow the links later. In addition, for the conversion, I used Flask version 1.1.2 .1 and Sonic version 20.3.0. So if you're using other version, then it probably means that syntax may vary a bit. So let's get started. Let's get started with the constructor. Um, pretty straightforward. Instead of importing Flask from Flask, we import Sonic from Sonic, and we change the constructor call, uh, and that's it. Let's talk about routes. Um, before we, we, you can see again, the, the, the curator remains the same, uh, at app dot route. Uh, but here you can see a difference, a couple of differences. Uh, on Flask, the request object is globally imported. And with Sonic, it is the first argument. It's a dependency injection. So whenever you have a route, the request is always the first argument. Another difference you can see here that on Sonic, the route is a coroutine. A coroutine is a function that uses the async keyword, as you can see here. Now let's go through the JSON response. Uh, there are a couple options with Flask for the, for the happy scenario. Uh, you can either return a dictionary or you can import JSONify and return the, the dictionary or, or as keyword args inside inside the JSONify and it basically wraps the response with the response object and sets the content type, the mime type, and, and the status code. Uh, with Sonic, there is one main way to go. From Sonic response, you import JSON and you wrap your response dictionary with the JSON. And now for the not so happy part uh, or the or handling, um, there is uh, there is this paper called RC7807 that talks about how, how errors should be handled in, in, in web APIs. So my examples try, try to follow this RFC. Uh, with Flask, you import the response object and then uh, you instantiate the response class. You give it a status for, for content type of application problem plus JSON instead of just application JSON. And you give it a response body. Um, we, we have to, to dump our dictionary. So this is what we do here. Um, with Sonic, it's pretty much the same. We return the same response.json object. We give it a body, change the content type, and give it a custom status. There are other options for Flask as well. You could also use the JSONify that we saw earlier and change its status because its default is 200 and return it. Auto reload uh, for a great feature for, for development purposes. Um, for Flask and Sonic, happily, it's the same. Um, there are other options as well. Um, for instance, for Flask, you can, from your terminal, uh, init a virtual and called flask underscore ends. And if you set it to a development, uh, then you get auto reload. And with Sonic, you could, you could start the app with a parameter called auto reload equals true. And then you don't get like debug verb or outputs or whatever. You only get the auto reload that you need for development. Um, blueprints, again, Blueprint is used for subrouting. It contains all the exposed method of a certain route. Uh, the main difference here, except for the import path, is that Sonic does not require an import name as an argument to the Blueprint constructor. In addition, when you register the Blueprint to your app, uh, with Flask, you call register Blueprint. And, and with Sonic, you call Blueprint. Um, you can use register Blueprint as well, uh, but it is marked as deprecated, and I only wanted to give you the latest and greatest. Uh, so now let's look on, on, our, uh, on how our app looks like uh, post-conversion. Uh, 
Um, as you can see here, there's a difference with the import path. And for the blueprint constructor, uh, you don't need the import name. Uh, for the for the create method, you have a deIsync keyword. You have request as the first argument, and we, instead of initializing a response object and set the response to none, uh, you call you call from response dot empty, and and that's that's the, that's the main difference here. For the read. Uh, instead of returning the JSONify, you return the response to JSON. We saw it earlier. Request is the first argument, but we're not using it, so I put an underscore instead, uh, which is the um, uh, which 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 is how you mark an unused variable in Python, but that you must pass. In addition, you have the async keyword, and we already talked about uh, this response type. Uh, for update, again, you have the async keyword, the request as the first argument, and again, instead of returning response object which response is none, you simply return a response dot empty. And for and for the for for code, instead of returning a response object with JSON dumps as response, you return a response dot JSON with your dictionary as body, and we delete. Well, it's pretty much the same, so I won't repeat myself again. Now let's talk a bit more and let's talk a bit about testing. Uh, the main difference here is that uh, with Flask, you get the test client through a method and a context manager. With Sonic, you get it through an attribute. Um, when, you call, uh, when you call server methods, with Flask, you get the response as object. And with Sonic, you get a request and a response as object. Again, uh, we're not using the request here, so I put an underscore instead. Uh, another difference is that with Flask, uh, you check the status code by an attribute called status underscore code. And with Sonic, the attribute is called status. Uh, here you can see the, the testing diff. Uh, you can see that apart from the changes we talked about at the previous slide. Everything is pretty much the same, including how you pass a body to the post request. You see here a JSON uh, that gets a dictionary. Um, you can see that everything here is pretty much the same. Um, there is another option. Uh, Sonic tests can also be asynchronous. For this, you need to add an additional package called pytest-sonic. Um, oh, and, and if you do that, there are a couple of differences. Um, you get only response as a result and not a request and a response, uh, but you need to await whenever, whenever, you, call, whenever you call the server. Other, other than that, uh, it is the same. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit more about deployment. I used here pretty much, I, I tried to, throughout my presentation, I tried to use uh, recommended stuff uh, by the creators themselves and not, and not use like uh, other stuff. So here as well. I used GeoUnicorn to deploy my app. Uh, for Flask, I used the default workers. For, Geo, for Sonic, I used the Uvicon workers. And I repeated my benchmark from the beginning, meaning I used AB and 10,000 requests with concurrency of 100. And for the run route, I got, I got between, we got between five and six X uh, performance. As you can see, the request per second instead of 1,000, uh, 6,500. And the time per request instead of 98 milliseconds, it's now around 50, 15 milliseconds, which is pretty awesome. Um, so everything sounded or read uh, pretty awesome so far, um, but it's not always a fairy tale um, because now you have a cognitive burden, meaning that to get a performance and effective and an effective synchronous code the event loop must never be blocked. Meaning whenever you do an IO, 
you should await it, like we saw earlier for the asynchronous test example. And whenever you have something that's CPU bounded, like compression we talked about earlier, then it should run elsewhere. It could run, it could run in executor or like in another process, but something that CPU bounded should never block the event loop. Otherwise, the code wouldn't be effective. In addition, Sonic's ecosystem is not rich as Flask ecosystem. It is noticeable on GitHub. Uh, you can see the awesome Sonic uh, project has around 9,000 9, stars, and the awesome Sonic has around 250. Uh, it is also noticeable on the number of available tutorials and on third party integration for stuff that is pretty useful for web application like uh, Swagger CodeGen, Out0, or Okta. In addition, um, when you're using a third party library, uh, you need to use its version that's not blocking IO, meaning that. If you're used to using Psycho PG2 for as your Postgres driver, uh, you cannot use it anymore because it will block the event loop and you need to use async PG or AIOPG. Instead of using request, you can use HTTPX or AIO HTTP. Instead of using Redis, you can, you can use AIO Redis or async IO Redis and you get the picture, you understand where it's going. By the way, that's the reason I didn't use a database for my application because I wanted to make my, com my comparison simple and fair and I didn't want the database driver uh, to have a part uh, in, in, in the decision of, of what happened, of, of why there are performance uh, differences. Um, some more, uh, some more, uh, now I'm going to talk to you about the async web, uh, the, the async web framework landscape. Um, I chose Sonic for the stock for several reasons, several reasons, I'm sorry. It's very popular on GitHub. It has around 4,000 stars. In addition, the APIs it exposes is very similar to the API Flask exposes. Um, when the API is different, is different. Um, it seems like a reasonable evolution that made possible because there wasn't too much of a need for backward compatibility. Um, it is also backed by a community run organization. And it's, uh, at least for me, it's a flashback for the 90s. Um, there is this Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, in addition, the, in addition, um, there is Quart uh, that its creator talked yesterday, Philip Jones, is also a Flask like async web framework. And in addition, there is Fast API. Uh, Fast API, um, I, call it, I call it a hybrid web framework because it supports both synchronous and asynchronous. Um, with dependency injection as a guiding principle. So um, you don't have like a global context that contains everything, that, but each route that needs to get what it needs to get, it gets it in, in its signature, which is uh, pretty awesome. So, <laughs> uh, so let's conclude. Um, when a Flask application uh, that mostly performs IO uh, becomes resource hungry, it is worthwhile to convert it to a Sonic app and the, and the effort for it is reasonable. But after you convert the app, the code must be IO and CPU aware in order to not block the event loop. That's it, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, we have questions. Uh, let's first see. Um, uh, maybe you can stop your screen share uh, unless we need to share more things. Um, we had a lot of votes for people who came in late. And so we, I have to ask you that question again. Is Sonic production stable in your opinion? Um, yeah, I used it.
for very I used it for very very focused uh, internal web web uh, web products that only did IO and for that it was very stable okay um, people are asking what's the main difference between Scenic and fast API if you have any experience with that um, yeah I'm a, I'm a bit less experienced with fast API uh, but with Sonic, like there is an event loop and everything needs to be asynchronous. With fast API, you can I, you can have like a mix in. You have you can have several routes that are synchronous and several routes that are asynchronous. In addition, whenever like um, let's say if you're a Flask, uh, Flask application or Sonic is the same and you have a database, then you hold it in your context and then you get you get the context, but for fast API, the, the database connection or session or whatever is an argument to the route. So that's 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 the main that's the main difference there. That, at least the, the way I see it. In in your benchmark you showed for Scenic, it looks like for Scenic less bytes were transferred. Can you explain this can, could this explain the part of the speed increase you noticed? Um I think I'll, I'll, I'll recheck my presentation again, but I think it might be like uh, either like um, an end line or something that's offended by something. But uh, it, it was pretty it was pretty obvious that for for IO uh, that for IO it can perform better. Okay. Um, somebody says without mentioning his name because it says anonymous attendee. Maybe it's a stupid question, but I've never used a uh, If I'm using a serverless function, for example, Amazon Lambda, uh, is there, uh, there is no advantage in being asynchronous. Is that correct? Um, so basically, well, do, uh, are, are, uh, AWS functions, uh, have they be synchronous or uh, does this give me any advantage? Um, I know, I know it, it kind of depends. So I think it depends on their implementation. Uh, but I think that with, with AWS Lambda, you're, you're paying for your execution time. Uh, but uh, if, if it reduces your execution time, then you can pay less. Um, right. But, <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it's worth benchmarking before like making uh, a decision. Yeah, but uh, there's there's not really a reason to be asynchronous uh, otherwise. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so maybe this was a stupid question, but actually there are not supposed to be any. So thank you for that question too. And the last one uh, I have here at the moment is a question: If in the programming, do we always have to use the word await if the function you is asynchronous at all, or is there um, others where you don't have to await? You always have to await uh, if you don't want to block the event loop. That's how I, I think IO works. Uh, Python have had and uh, has other frameworks uh, that work as well. Like uh, for I, I wrote uh, an, an async an async uh, program in Python ten years ago, and I didn't have to await anything. But for async IO uh, based, you have to await everything. Um, again, because otherwise you would block your event loop and you'll get performance uh, uh, degradation that you cannot expect. Okay, so this is all the questions we have in the Zoom chat, but there has been a, a rather large discussion in the <laughs> talk flashing await Discord channel. So if you have any more questions, uh, please go over to that channel. And David, I think uh, you, it would be nice if you could join that for a while so that people could, in their lunch break maybe ask some more questions. I learned With a lot. Pleasure. Really happy for your talk. So let's let's thank you uh, about this for this.